Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. My name is Callan Steinman. I'm Curator of Education here at the Georgia Museum of Art, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's program, an artist talk um, with Sarah Brahman, our special guest this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Jeff Richmond Mall, Curator of American Art at the Museum, to begin today's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Callan. Thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, we're glad you're here. And I'm so pleased to be joined by Sarah Brahman, who uh, received a BFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art and an MFA from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. Um, her work appears in our current exhibition, Neo Abstraction, Celebrating a Gift of Contemporary Art from John and Sarah Schlesinger. Um, that's the work you're seeing on the screen in front of you, uh, the 2008 sculpture entitled Coexist. Uh, we welcome you to, to come to the museum and, and see her work along with other selections from that gift. And um, we're so grateful to the Schlesingers for um, bringing this collection into, uh, into our museum um, to share with our audiences. Um, so as I mentioned, um, Sarah Brahman, uh, her work not only uh, is, is on view at the museum, but has appeared uh, in solo exhibitions at the McAvoy Foundation for the Arts, Mitchell Innes and Nash, Marlboro Contemporary in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, and also in group shows at Crystal Bridges, Mass Mocha, and the Kemper Museum, among, among many others. Um, Works of hers are also currently on view uh, until tomorrow, I think, uh, at Herschel and Adler Gallery in New York City in the exhibition, Our Secret Fire, Contemporary Artists in the Alchemical Tradition. And she is also one of the founders of the artist-run gallery Canada in New York. Brahman transforms everyday objects into works that propel light, and she combines scraps of metal with translucent pieces of color to create precariously balanced sculptures radiating with her signature palette of magentas, oranges, blues, and purples. Her formidable abstract sculptures suggest themes of nature, family, and home. And I've asked her to speak about um, the work that's on view here at the museum, uh, but also in the context of, of her larger career um, and including some exciting uh, recent work like those that are on view in New York City uh, and some really wonderful outdoor work that she's been producing recently. Um, so uh, what we'll do is Sarah will we'll, we'll speak for a little bit, then we'll have a, a little bit of a conversation uh, with some questions and then open it up to you all for your questions. And I know um, Sarah is excited to, to hear from you um, and, and uh, engage with, with you all this evening. So um, turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Jeff and Callan for facilitating. Uh, it's great to be here. It's weird and great to be on Zoom. And um, yeah, and thank you, to John and Sarah, it's, um, we were talking a little bit before we signed on here and I was just thinking, um, it's really one of the most special things that, that can happen to an artist is to see, or I'll just speak for myself, for me, that I can see where something lands. You know, you have very intimate relations with this work in the studio and then it goes out into the world. And if you're lucky, um, it goes into somebody else's um, realm for them to, to care for. And it, it really is, it's such a, it's such a good feeling um, to see where these things wind up. And also I just am filled with a lot of appreciation for anybody who's gonna care for such a weird object like this. Sculpture is even harder. So, um, you know, it takes, it takes somebody with um, a lot of curiosity and excitement and real love of art to commit themselves to actually not only paying for something, but giving up space in their life, um, uh, you know, to an artwork. So, and, it, and it's, it's cool also, it's amazing to see this in context, although I haven't seen the show in person to just have been looking at the show online and see the amazing context. Um, and collection that this is all 
at the museum right now. I, I hope to get there. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, really an expression of, of these collectors vision. And that's, that's cool to see, so. Um, I was going to start with um, a couple shots that this is, I've actually moved into a new studio, but this is pretty recent. This is a couple, you know, 20, 2020, probably. Um, I was going to just run through a few pictures of what the studio practice looks like and then, you know, try to imagine it, 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 it had, it doesn't change that much over the years. I mean, some things change, um, but there's some things that are probably very similar to when I made the sculpture that's in the show. And just, I thought if we looked at the studio and then could imagine how this kind of sculpture could be formed or tumble out of this mess. <laughs> so, um, you know, I like to work on a lot of things at the same time. Um, it feels a lot to me like gardening, um, where there's like different things growing, different things at different stages. Um, and certainly there's always, you know, there can be a focus where if I'm building an exhibition, I'm obviously focusing on a certain body of work. Um, but it's usually it, it often is that all the work is being worked on almost simultaneously. Certain thing, things finish um, maybe ahead of the other, but it, it's really um, a process of, uh, you know, kind of going from one thing to the next um, with points of focus in between. And this is my son, who's one of all, I have three sons and <laughs> this is the youngest. So he's, He's the only one left at home, so he's the one that's in the studio the most, but the other ones help me. Now they can really help <laughs> their grownups. Um, and so I think this kind of went backwards. This I think is from around 2017, um, 16. Um, And this is Coexist, the piece in the show. And um, it's, uh, this piece was made actually right, it, it, it was made, um, it was made outside of an exhibition kind of right after I finished a, a larger exhibition at uh, a gallery that's now defunct in New York called Museum 52. Um, and it's the hatch of a, of a car and this chair that I found and um, a steel cube, which at that, that point um, I was working uh, with plexiglass, colored plexiglass, which um, I would, you know, I could cut myself and would, would cut to fit in these cubes that I would, uh, I had somebody local here that I knew was helping me make those, and um, and um, these would the, these sculptures came together, um, much like you saw in the pictures of the studio, where there's a lot of things happening all at once, and it just if things you know trying different things, almost like thinking about the, if there was a force of nature that brought these objects together. Um, and just thinking about, um, I guess the experience of life in a non-linear way, um, in a way where um, things kind of come in and out of focus through our day and our life and um, just maybe a way to think about them um, joining up uh, and then through this through this kind of transparent light and, and color, um, it, if for me, it kind of talks about the, you know, what maybe what we don't see, maybe the, the spiritual realm or another realm um, outside of the physicality of, of, you know, of these objects. Um,
And it's great to see this. I, I was gushing with, with Jeff over the, the Daniel Hesitance painting in the background, which is just so gorgeous and I've never seen in person. So along with all the other art in the show, I'm dying to come and see that, that piece in person. It's so beautiful. Um, And this, this is a piece that um, came around the same time. I thought I'd include it as a little bit, a little bit later. I think this was, um, yeah, a couple, this is a couple years. It was maybe 2011. Um, this piece is called Your Song. And it's a cast piece of two by four. So the stick is a, is a cast aluminum two by four that's painted and bolted onto this cube along with the radio. Um, and this was an exhibition called In Spite of Ourselves um, from 2017. Um, again, um, you know, objects, uh, you know, pulling together objects in the studio, like for instance, in this, there's the, this little bamboo table that was my granny's, um, this chair that I found, um, which I don't know if you all can see, but in the end of the log, there's a, there's a slot and there's a book in the slot. So that, that piece is sort of made to hold a book. Um, and I, I guess I always, you know, the, 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 these things are, there are, you know, shots that are in the, in the gallery, but I always try to imagine, and I, I feel like I make the work really for somebody's home, not necessarily for the gallery setting. Um, so for instance, in the piece with the book, um, which I think was called Read to Me, you know, the, my hope was always that if this wound up in someone's collection that they would actually, you know, look at the book <laughs> and it would become part of their, their daily life and their lived experience in the home. Um, and certainly with the glass pieces, um, I think a lot about the movement of light throughout the day and what, how that would affect the piece and how that might if, if be affected by and affect the environment of the home. Um, and then this is, uh, again, a little bit um, later. Um, this is a, a piece that I did for a show in New York with Mitchell Innocent Nash. And this piece is called, um, How Do We Sleep uh, When the Earth is Melting? And this was part of a show, um, it was called um, Yours. And um, again, this is uh, bunk beds, um, dyed bed sheets. This is glass. I, at this point, I had, had moved to using glass rather than plexiglass, mostly for um, I was finding the adhesives on the plexiglass kind of toxic and started to feel like that was maybe affecting my health. Um, and also the color it's a bit, was a bit limited with the plexi and with this, with using the colored glass uh, found it was, it could get this really dynamic range of color, which is so exciting. Um, that's pretty limitless. Her chair, um, this is from a little bit later, this, um, let's see, this is, uh, this is from this is this is pretty recent from 2019. It's from a show, another show I did in New York called Growth at Mitchell Innes at a smaller space they had uptown. So I made kind of smaller sculptures. And the next one too, I think, is from that show. This one's called Home. I think there might be okay. Um, so again, this is, I, I, I started, um, it's probably in like early, like 2010, I started, um, using more of the wood carving, like actually carving, 
getting big chunks of wood delivered from a local uh, a local mill that we also we get our firewood from them and um, they they often have like off cuts of stuff that doesn't really make for lumber um, that I would have them come and just deliver a dump truck load and started carving um, really enjoying using the chainsaw and pretty pretty crude and I'm still pretty pretty crude carver but um, I you know some of these things are found and given like the like the chair elements and I in, in some ways I even though I fabricate the cubes and in, in some ways they act like a found object in a way it's like I, I sometimes make the cubes separately of a sculpture and then then they 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 can either go here or there it's not sometimes I make them specifically for one sculpture but sometimes I kind of assemble a cube and then it becomes like a found object in the studio and so having these wood pieces that I could alter with the chainsaw was kind of like I could I could this was a way I could fuse these objects together and like and, and really um um, you know, art articulate in an intentional way what the joint was going to be like between how these objects came together because I could actually carve out the, the spaces that I needed. Um, uh, this is another, this is a pretty recent piece called Friend. Again, it's, it's um, the the car carved um, chunk of wood on the bottom and then some found furniture parts and glass on top. Um, this is on the screen, Space Talk. This was um, from the same show that the, the, the uh, bunk bed piece was in. Um, and again, this is, yeah, glass and steel up top and um, just a, you know, barely, barely altered um, log on the bottom. Uh, this piece is called Growth. It was from the show of that name. This is a pretty small piece. Um, and this is an older, this is older. It's, it's kind of cool to put together works and see, I mean, I think the work evolves, but it's also kind of funny and to see like, oh, wow, it's, <laughs> this is a pretty old piece. This is, this is called um, Teenage Spaceship and it's from 2010. Um, and I'm really still, you know, interested in a lot of the same things and, um, yeah, this was a this was kind of a important piece for me. I think one of the earlier large pieces where I felt like um, there was this moment of these innate uh, these objects that were kind of inert, like the truck cap, um, the jeep cap, but but taken from maybe a part of life that for me I do a lot of driving. I grew up doing a lot of driving, and I love I love being in the car and um, or truck and um, you know, this thing of this very normal kind of inert in a way, day-to-day -day object, um, just spliced with um, this transparent color that for me, um, again, it's, it's sort of like reaching for uh, some way to talk about what we can't see and these things that aren't, aren't physical part of our life, um, things more spiritually oriented. And, um, you know, of course we have like, uh, you know, there's, I'm not a religious person, but, you know, throughout history in all, all across so many cultures and religions, we have stained glass uh, worked into architecture that, that, that people were using, I think, to, to talk about these same things. And I also think about, um, the uh, spiritualists in, in landscape painting and even, um, you know, how so much of, uh, of landscape painting has to do with what, what um, it, can, can this be, you know, can this, can, can light falling to earth and how it falls on physical objects on the earth, um, can that be a metaphor for how, 
um, you know, how and why and, you know, spirit can, can fall and um, be part of or interact with the physical world. Um, this is a piece called um, Driving, Sleeping, Screwing, Reading. Uh, and I think that's mid 20, oh, let's see, 2016. Um, and this was one of the, this was kind of the first piece where people could go inside the sculpture. Um, and it was funny when I was making this piece, uh, I remember thinking like, I can't do this. I had the thing set up in parts in the studio it had kind of grown. Um, I didn't really have a plan. I mostly, mostly make things, um, you know, without like a, like, it's not like I, I had a vision of this in my head and I sat down and drew it and then executed it. I might have a couple frames that were made that I, you know, I'm playing around with and then the thing just kind of grows. And I, my son, my youngest son was pretty, pretty little then would come over and I would kind of like throw him, throw this little mattress and some books in what was the beginning of this sculpture just to kind of keep him occupied. <laughs> And, um, and I found that I really liked being in there reading to him and reading on my own. And I remember thinking, oh, this is stupid. I can't, I can't have a sculpture that has books in it and people go in. I don't know, it just felt like gimmicky or kind of, you know, like these tapes in your head as an artist sometimes of telling you why you can't do stuff because it's stupid. And, um, and then the sculpture just kept like insisting on being what it was, which is the most beautiful and amazing thing that I think people can do, but also sculptures can do when you're making them is they just insist on being what they are and what they're meant to be. And for some reason it was just um, meant, to, meant to hold people in books and offer actually a place for people to be, um, not just for something for people to look at. And I didn't really know what that was gonna feel like um, but I did it anyway because I listened to the sculpture, and it it's it's it was fun, and it it it's informed my work, and it, it continues to inform my work. Kind of opening up like that, um, you can see in some of the later outdoor works too. Um, I I wound up making a bunch of reading rooms <laughs> over the next couple of years. I think I made three or four different sculptures that were all meant to be gone into, and and. Uh, read and hang out in. Um, and this is a this is a piece called here, um, which you, you can't go you can't go in, but um, maybe put the other one first, but um, this is, you know, it's, this is a piece that um, has grown out of uh, interest I had one other, a couple other before this that I made for outdoors that, um, and uh, one other where I started to use, work with these concrete drainage culverts. Um, there's a place I drive by a lot when I'm on my way, I live in Massachusetts and I go to the city and um, it, you, these are pretty ubiquitous. They're basically under every road, everywhere, all over the country. Um, they you know, they get built and linked together to um, help transmit water, sewage, um, electric lines. And um, I started thinking about those as vehicles for uh, outdoor work, um, you know, partly because I really like using a found object and partly because uh, they're so, I find them so beautiful to begin with. And they, and they also just don't care about the weather which is, you know, one of these big kind of more could be seen as boring or technical things about working outdoors. But I, I really like that challenge of um, having to make something that can stand up uh, to the environment. Um, and this was very simple. I, I, I asked them to put the holes where I wanted them. You know, they're used to working with people that need holes in certain places. So it wasn't that, that different from the way they work with maybe other people. Um, at this um, at this manufacturer, and then I um, fitted the, these these four 
sides or lenses with with frames and colored glass that sort of changes you walk around and it's a pretty subtle thing um it's called here and i was really just focusing on and thinking about how can i provide um, people and experience with color and mass so that how can I, um, how can I invite people to slow down and be really involved in this experience of looking and looking at, you know, as you move around the sculpture, looking at how, how the light changes, how the color changes. Um, and really that was kind of the, the whole exercise, um, and you know the the reflections, the transparencies, all that like you know really was thrilling for me to get to see how that pl all played out. And then the um, this next one was another reading room. So this was the first concrete piece that I did, um, and this is a picture of it where it now is is, is on a on a loan kind of semi-permanent or however long they'll keep it alone at Art Omai in, in um, upstate New York. And this was another culvert that, um, so um, I just made drawings of where I wanted the, the holes to be and then fitted those holes with this little bookshelf um, and these two uh, colored windows, which were, wound up being able to project the light and color in this really beautiful way that acted like a sundial as well um, throughout the day. These circles of light kind of move around the piece and onto the, um, out onto the grass too, or snow. <laughs> And, and people did really tend to tend to use it and um, they, they seem to read the books and hang out in there, which has been really, really nice to see. I think that's the last slide. Well, thank you, Sarah, this was, this was great. And, um... I know I have some questions. We already have a couple questions in the in the Q and A box, um, but I, I just yeah I wanted to start um, by thinking about your work and what you what you shared um, in relation to you know the, the the context that I tried to create for it with this exhibition at the museum, which is um, thinking about these kind of late twentieth into you know the 21st century um, uh, you know explorations of the the idea of abstraction and and how artists are responding I think in certain ways to to you know histories of art and the history of abstraction um, and you know and one of the ways that that I see this and um, Clearly, other curators have picked up on this as well because your work, uh, this this piece, if we can go back, um, was included in an exhibition called Color Field, Color Fields, um, that originated at Crystal Bridges. Um, so I wonder, you know, if you could talk at all. You know, this this notion of the of a color field um, has roots in some ways in mid 20th century abstract painting, right? And the color field painting as kind of a um, contemporary phenomenon with, with the action painting of, of artists like Pollock. You have Rothko and others um, uh, exploring color. And then as you move into more minimalist forms, um, and, and I think you're probably also dealing with the, the history and legacy of minimalism with these cubes. Um, but can you talk about, you know, how you think about your works at a little bit more as color fields. Uh, one one question that also came in is, you know, the specific colors that you choose for these works and where where those decisions are made. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, for sure, I, 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 um, I'm thinking about like I went to undergrad school in um, in Baltimore, and there's a Rothko room there, which was, you know, as an 18 year old without like a ton of knowledge about any kind of art, contemporary art, like going in and experiencing those paintings, you know, kind of quintessential color field paintings. Um, that was a real formative experience and um, and visiting the chapel in Texas, also the Rothko Chapel. And, um, you know, though, I guess, you know, where I, where I, where I feel um, like there's, we'll never run out a road with, with that is that, um, that, that abstraction, um, you know, there's, there's so much of abstraction certainly in that, in that era um, where it's, uh, it's different from pictorial, you know, pictorial depictions and artwork. It's like, it, it, it's almost like just a little bit further beyond language. And um, I think this attempt to communicate, um, so it's like, not only are you not gonna use, use language, you're not gonna even use pictures. So it's like, how, how, how are you communicating without, without these two things that we tend to lean on as human beings to do our communicating? We, we use pictures and language, written or spoken language. So um, I think, you know, I, I kind of think of it in those terms, like abstraction is, is that well of like, how am I gonna communicate without these two, without these, you know, beyond and outside of these two realms. Um, and yeah, and I, 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 I don't, I, I'm still, I, I mean, I'll never, that'll never get old for me. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, I'm absolutely tied to those, those explorations and those legacies. Um, and, and before, you know, because of before, you know, <laughs> abstract expressionism and, and color field and minimalism, there was, you know, there's, there's as, as, as long as there have been humans making marks, there have been humans making abstract design and mark making, um, whether it's in, you know, designs and mosaics and on, on people's clothing. Um, yeah, patterned, you know, patterned uh, ceramics, I, all that kind of stuff. So I think it's like, it's not that abstraction is new, you know, it's just, um, it's, it's always been this way of people trying to communicate. Um, yeah, again, like with, without a picture or, or words. And um, the other part of the question was minimalism and- um, Well, the other part of the question, I guess, um, to, to, as what, which someone, uh, an audience also raises, you know, your choice of colors. Yeah. Um, if you're thinking, I, it also makes me wonder, um, are you talking about these found forms? How much, how much is the material that, cause you mentioned also, you know, the transition from plexiglass to glass and, you know, whether, um, the forms are dictating certain choices too versus, um, you know, your own choice about um, color and tone and, and those sorts of things. So can, it, can you talk about, you know, that, those de decisions and, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think um, for sure, um, you know, the color is kind of, it's like, I can't, you know, the, the, the kind of quick answer is like, I just can't help it. It's like, I can't, I can't, I can't beat whatever my palette is out of myself. Um, and although it does, you know, slowly shifts and change, changes over time, um, I, I do wind up continuing to just be thrilled to by what color does together. And um, again, like this is, yeah, like how it layers up. Um, and um, I don't know, I've always tended toward the tertiary um, palette and, and the found objects, you know, I think like uh, a lot of time, I didn't realize this till 
you asked that question and I was like looking through these pieces, I think, you know, sometimes like in this piece with the concrete, with the wood, it's kind of like the, the, the found object is just like giving this rest from this intense color or maybe providing some counter, you know, here it's black on the concrete pieces. It's this, this, this beautiful gray. And then certainly with the wood pieces, it's, you know, this, these tans and browns that might, um, and maybe I did, again, like, I'm just feeling this out. I hadn't thought about this before, but there's a way in which I'm kind of using these found objects to, uh, you know, to at least <laughs> dial down a little bit, you know, my, my impulses and give some kind of counter. Um, but I, I've, yeah, I've always like, I've always like brown and working with wood, the paint, and they didn't show any works, uh, any uh, flat works here, but I've always done all the painting usually is on um, plywood and wood. And I really like that as a starting point better. It's just easier than white for me somehow. Um, but the color, yeah, I mean, I, it tends towards sunset and magic hour. Um, it always feels really corny and cliche when I talk about it. So it's hard, but it's, I think, um, yeah, I think it's, it's just one of these things where it's, it's what it's, again, like it's the sculpture telling me what it needs to be. And I can kind of go through all these things in my mind saying like, really, are you going <laughs> to go here again? And then the sculpture's like, yep, we got to do another one and um, see what happens this time if we shift that blue panel over here instead. And then, you know, it just goes like that in a very slow fashion. So it's curiosity about what's going to happen. I think with the with the glass, that's kind of one of the things that's fun about the color and and keeps you know keeps me so engaged is just um, how these things are going to um, how they're going to act in like once they're made in real time with shifting light, you know, with the with the different hours of the day in shadow, in direct sun, um, all those questions. Well, I wanted to to go back um, to coexist, um, and I, I I do think it's kind of interesting that this the purple of the coexist sticker um, is so perfect for the palette that you continue um, to to use. But um, thinking about this. Um, your discussion of process. And, you know, I hadn't really, another comparison that comes to mind um, when you were talking about how, you know, sometimes um, you kind of leave, leave these things <laughs> together in the studio and they, 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 they converge in this sort of swirling space of all sorts of different objects. Um, uh, the uh, you talked about this kind of non-linear nature of of our lived existence and in daily life um, sort of made me think about the three elements of coexist as kind of like an exquisite corpse. Um, you know, with the, the the you have the three different parts of the body that you know one artist passes to the next and the next. And um, I hadn't really thought about surrealism uh in relation to these works but there is a way that um you know the 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 assemblage of of three different kind of banal or um domestic or familiar objects when put together exceeds some of their parts um uh and and of course that is at the heart of the title of the work which you know i'm sure co comes from the bumper sticker but is kind of demanding something of the work too, that, you know, they literally have to coexist in order for the work to, <laughs> to support itself, that they're mutually leaning on each other um, to, to remain stable as a structure, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that because I, I mean, and I know I noticed this this exhibition where your work is currently on view um, on alchemy. Uh, you know, this I this idea of alchemy as um, 
the combination of certain things to produce something, um, you know, uh, even, uh, even purer than, than the sum of the parts or something richer and more precious, you know, um, al alchemy and these, this sort of sorcery of making gold out of, of um, inexpensive uh, matter. Um, but there's something, I think there's something really interesting about this concept of alchemy and the, the this kind of metamorphosis of, of things that's happening. And I um, just wonder if you could talk more about how you see that, that playing out and um, in works like this one or, or others. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that's really apt and um, I'm into it. <laughs> I think, um, I, I think, I think it, I think it does, you know, um, yeah, this kind of coming together of material, um, materials, um, that might guess, not normally come together really does feel true to what 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 happens in in the studio and it's just like it also happens in the best areas of my life um so i i like that um you know just kind of forcing or maybe forcing is not the right word but like setting up environments where um curiosity and trying things can actually lead to, you know, new ways of looking. And again, like, I feel like the best areas of my life kind of have that same curiosity and interest and, and the, and, you know, and some of the best um, experiences I have in the studio also um, come from that, from that, um, yeah, creating an environment where thing, I was thinking about the garden, you know, these garden gardening. It, 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 I, I, I'm pretty involved in plants in my life. And um, there's, there's like weird cross pollination that happens in just like a home garden, which is so fascinating and amazing. And it's just by like planting two kinds of beans next to each other. And then they, this summer, like two, varieties, literally, I didn't know this was gonna happen, but they cross pollinated. And then I had this new kind of bean, literally, like it was a, a one that was green lima and this Christmas red and white lima bean. And they literally cross pollinated and turned the green lima beans, all these different weird colors of red. And um, I don't know, that maybe is a, a weird tangent, but um, yeah, and just in life too, like with people, with places, with um, architecture, anything, like the more I'm setting up situations in my life where I'm gonna be um, interacting with something that's like outside of what my daily no quote unquote norm would be. I think those are the places that, yeah, are, are tend to be the richest places of experience for me in life. And, um, and, and in the studio, it's like, it's, it's just great to be surprised. That's the thing that keeps me coming back to the studio is just the, the you know, it's just this amazing place of surprise. Um, you know, that's like the one thing you can count on is that eventually you, you know, I will be surprised by what's happening in the studio. And, um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's like, that's such a gift. Um, so I think, I think that relates to what you're talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. And I guess, you know, another way of, of thinking about this too is, um, you know, the, the, ex, the kind of exhortation of the title, right, that it could be really a state of being of that coexists as saying, you know, is describing, but in a way it's also, it could be a verb that is <laughs> sort of a command that we ought to um, coexist. I'm, I'm wondering if, if we also think about um, this work, which I think also has a pretty evocative title, um, 
how do we sleep when the planet is melting being the this the subtitle right you know i'm wondering also about the kind of ethical dimensions of this you know that um how 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 does that play a role in you know the work that you're doing and you know do you feel like that kind of i mean when when you look at some of these it almost feels like um we're looking at spaces of of refuge we're looking at um places we can kind of camp out um we can occupy for a time but there are also there's also something kind of almost post-apocalyptic about some of these pieces like like you know putting together the the remnants of our of a world that was um and i wonder if you have thought you know thought about that at all in in sort of thinking of as i said the kind of the the ethics of the work or the commentary of the work is that mm. is that way off base are you how are you no, no. I, I mean that's a really it's a really interesting question and um it's it's stuff that i um it's stuff that i think about i i um yeah it's 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 uh i guess it's like um let's talk about it, you know, like a sculpture can also be like a, hey, let, let's talk about it. Let's talk about this, um, let, you know, and, um, and I, I, yeah, like this, this piece, I think, you know, the title came from that. It's like, uh, I don't really know how to, how to talk about this or how to, you know, how, how to be with this, but I'm just gonna say it anyway, because otherwise, um, I'm not saying it. <laughs> and, and then, um, and I, I, I do, I do think that there's, there's a way of, um, I mean, I, I think that um, anytime that we can, that I can create a space for somebody to slow down and like that create work that's really an invitation for people to be with it and maybe even be inside it um, and actually physically slow down and be be supported by it by resting their back or you know whatever and also be invited to have an experience that's I mean uh, it's so hard it's like uh, I, I understand that that all this work everything we're doing here this world of contemporary art I run you know I'm involved in running an art gallery I I I am very aware of the deep intersection isn't really the right word the deep like uh reliance on and within capitalism like I'm not you know I'm so inside that system um at this point whether whether I like it or not um but I, I do think that um, creating spaces for people to to con be in contemplation and to be to not be doing anything like I I I have to I know this is a tall order and I don't want it to sound too presumptuous or but I I, I do think that those those things are 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 anti-capitalist by nature. It's like asking people, to, inviting people to slow down and look, inviting people to slow down and sit, to read a book. Um, for me, it, at least that's my desire. I don't know how they function in the world. Like I'm not gonna go that far, but um, it comes from an impulse to actually slow down in this world where everything is about kind of consumption and owning and um the speed and pace of work and acquisition and um you know I, I do I do think that art can be this you know it doesn't always function like this and I know there's so much problematic in 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 this world of um contemporary art and the way it's experienced and dealt and all that but I do I do really believe that um 
that art can provide this moment of real experience with a person that doesn't have to do with consumption, that has to do with an, ex an, uh, an exchange, uh, a, a spiritual exchange between, an, between an, this inanimate object and a human being that has to do with, um, with experience rather than consumption. And, um, you know, I just, I call me old fashioned, but I, I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of plugging for that. And, um, and now I have no idea how that connects to what your question was, but. <laughs> I mean, it connects because the question was, you know, the, the ethics of all of this. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. The kind of, is there an ethical imperative, you know, that. Yeah. And, and I think like being continuing to be troubled, like that for the, me, that's where my, where my ethics falls. Like I'm, I'm going to continue to be troubled by all of it. Um, and do it anyway and, 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 and try to find a way, um, to invite and create space for people to have an ex experience that might be a pause from, some of these, um, you know, some of this late capitalist hell that we're all living. <laughs> well, um, I want to make sure I, we also touch on a couple questions in the chat, some of which are all, you know, thinking about um, people are curious about similar things. Um, so specifically, um, and speaking of time, um, and spending time, and we're looking at a work called Here, which I guess demands that we be present, right? Um, uh, but um, one question that came in asks uh, yeah. about you know, the longest amount of time you spent working on a piece. Um, someone else asks um, how, uh, how you know when you're done with a sculpture. Uh, that probably has changed in terms of these outdoor works, I'm sure, um, as has the, the, this question, which is, you know, an original design concept versus the final execution. How do those things change? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm running through these couple of questions just for the sake of time, but also because I want to click out of this, um, if you don't mind, out of the PowerPoint and let people see those drawings on the wall in the background <laughs> on your video, um, oh. which must be studies for some some of the works that we looked at um today so I, i'm sure these are, that yeah. these are actually somebody made which a friend of mine oh wow joe bradley who's a dear another artist who i love he made these of a sculpture so which is so they're not studies no which changes the question <laughs> yeah which is but, such a sweet thing that artists can do for each other is draw each other's art <laughs> um, but I do, you know, you're so right with like the larger outdoor works, um, that, that definitely needs, you know, that needs planning drawings. Um, it's not like it can really get, I, I do a lot of model making. So that's where the experimentation comes is just in cardboard and paper 3d models. Um, and, and certainly some drawing too, um, and all that happens ahead of time. And then, you know, then, then, it, then it gets pretty locked in, um, in terms of, um, creating, yeah, creating drawings and plans and, you know, uh, engineer drawings, um, for those, like, for instance, for those, uh, concrete pieces. Um, so it does, it does, it does take take some time um, and um, it is a bit of a thrill and kind of nerve wracking to be planning something. It's just not the way I'm used to working. So it is, it, it's, it's different to be planning something and that without really being able to be so hands-on. Um, but it's, it's a thrill to, to like have be working on these drawings and models and then have, have the thing come into, being um, this multi-ton, these multi-ton behemoth um, get willed into being. And um, so in a case like this, you, you had said um, 
you this was up on the screen when you were talking about how sometimes even these cubes are found objects in relation to other objects that you have. Have you have you ever, you know, uh, I'm sure, uh, but you know, this has happened, but assembled these parts and then said, oh, this is not, <laughs> this is not oh, working yeah. or, oh, you know. Yes, um, oh, all the time, absolutely, like 90% of the time not working. Yeah. Yeah, maybe so, more. And then, and then the things that you see are the, you know, this is like 10% work all clicks. Um, but absolutely, it's, it's a constant um, moving around of, you know, things until they sort of click into place. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the moment. Yeah, because that this question of how do you know when it's really yeah, done? Yeah, and that, I mean, that's just like, honestly, it's just, it's completely um, intuitive and it's, it's all feeling. It's le less fact, more feeling. Um, but it's funny because I was talking to an artist who's working on a show upcoming <laughs> at the gallery and they were saying they've gone back and like started working on these paintings that they thought they were finished with. But then the pickup date is in a week. So like that's when they're going to be finished when <laughs> when the truck comes to uh, to pick up the artwork. That's it. So. Well, we all need deadlines. That's, right? that's happened so. to me before, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, that's about all the time we have. And I, I think we've answered most of everyone's questions that I see here. So um, I just wanted to, to thank you again for for joining us, making time to to share about your work and um, and have this conversation. We're um, so grateful. We um, I look forward to you know, sharing the show with you uh, or the museum uh, whenever it is that you can come down to Athens and see us. But um, um, thank you. Thanks to everyone in the audience for sticking with us. And um, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this conversation. And um, speaking of uh, Sarah mentioned Daniel Hesitance uh, and his work, um, we will be uh, enjoying his company in November uh, with another artist talk related to the New York Abstraction Show. So we hope you'll uh, come back for that as well. Stay tuned for details on that. So thank you, Sarah. Uh, it was a Thanks pleasure so to, to talk to you. It's an honor. And it was really, yeah, really, really special to get to talk to you. Appreciate it so much. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye.